All right, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're at today. Uh, today, um, we are recording the session, so you should have just seen the pop-up on your computer. So I will, as usual, send it out after we are done. Uh, welcome to May's webinar in our continuing series. Today's topic is UVC technology and the physics of light, of UV light. Uh, as always, put your questions in the chat and we'll review them at the end. Uh, Dan Haney is our presenter again. Uh, most of you are returning, so I won't give the whole spiel, um, and I will just hand it over to Dan. Take it away. Well, Kelly, thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us today on our Session 5 in Veritex Webinar Web Wednesday Educational Seminar Series. Uh, today's presentation is on UBC technology, and uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. All right, if you could, Kelly, if you could let me know that uh, you, the screen has been captured. You're good. You're good to go. All right. All right. Again, uh, many of you are returning from previous sessions, so I'll be brief on my introduction. Uh, um, again, my name is Dan Haney, and I've been in the industry for 35 years. And my role at Veritech is in educating on the state of the nation on high performance heating and ventilating solutions, as well as specialty products and applications. And when tasked with the pandemic last year, as we all have been, uh, I really have done a deep dive to do all I can to be informed on the evolving uh, uh, world of construction and pandemic and uh, updated guidelines provided by the CDC and ASHRAE. Uh, <clears throat> please be aware for those who might be newcomers that Veritech is not only a manufacturer's representative, we are an HVAC system solution provider. We've been in the industry for 45 years and have a presence throughout the Southwest from San Diego through to Lubbock, Texas. And we can work on any type of commercial building application, even residential, uh, from healthcare to data centers, manufacturing, government, et cetera. We can assist in all of these uh, construction efforts in coming up with good design solutions and control solutions for the built environment. Uh, we have uh, an expertise on the evolving and emerging high performance HVAC systems. We can look at variable refrigerant systems. Uh, we can look at package central plants and design and controls. We can do underfloor air systems, 100% outside air systems, please. If you have any questions about these emerging technologies and applications of which many installations we already have have been very effective in solution, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have and uh, assist in any way that we can to get you real information on them. Um, Veritech's role uh, in uh, bringing me on board is to give us an opportunity to give back to our community the tremendous resources and experience we have with our engineering sales team in shaping the future to better HVAC solutions. And we launched the Veritech Technical Institute, uh, which the webinar Wednesday series is involved with, um, to uh, provide an educational platform for continued learning in the HVAC industry with a focus on high performance buildings and innovative technologies for a better built environment. Uh, <clears throat> here is a schedule of the Webinar Wednesday series that we've had. We started Wednesday on February 10th, and we are currently scheduled to move through until January of 2022. Please be aware that it is my intent, and hopefully if I do my job, each series is a building block in building an overall vision on how we might be able to assess possible heating and ventilating solutions for new construction and retrofit applications. And we'll be expanding starting in July into thermal stratification, dilution, and evaluating displacement ventilations and weaving back into the discussion each of these individual topics to look at an integrated approach to creating a healthier built environment. Uh, today, I have to acknowledge uh, resources that I've drawn from. And in fact, I am very conservative here. Obviously, the ASHRAE, the CDC, UV uh, resources for the excellent material they've provided us and uh, how UV light works and uh, how the devices are built. 
an AccuTherm for evaluation of how to create effectively mixed air environments throughout the operating range of a system. Uh, so today's agenda, we're just going to do a quick webinar series review. We're going to have another update from the CDC and ASHRAE on COVID-19 transmission. Um, the, the plot thickens. Uh, then we're going to look at ASHRAE's epidemic task force, and we're going to specifically look at language in the filtration and disinfection link there, because it does specifically address UV lighting. And then we're going to look at the nature of light, what is light? What is UV light? What are UV light generators? And what is ultraviolet germicidal irradiation and applications recommended by the epidemic task force and in induct upper room and induct surface disinfection? Then we're going to look at some UVC layout design considerations and strategies before we conclude. So let's just step back a minute and re, uh, 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 reacquaint ourselves with some of the topics that we've covered. In session one, <clears throat> we started with ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force. The task force, let me remind you, was six months ahead of the CDC in advocating for the possible transmission of aerosolized uh, SARS-CoV-2 versus just fomitic or large droplet uh, contamination or transmission within the six foot social distancing guidelines. The CDC has since adopted that. So this has uh, really been my go-to reference is ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force and it's expanding knowledge as more and more research is entered into it, updating these documents dynamically throughout the year. In session two, we looked at the physics of pathogen migration. Uh, how do particles fall? Uh, what is an expiratory event and how do they impact trajectories of particles released into the built environment? Uh, we looked at airflow and ventilation, displacement ventilation, and some prescriptive measures to reduce the aerosolization rates of particles once they're ejected into the space. In session three, we had the kind presence of Dr. Hoy Bohannon, or, or, or Hoy Bohannon, distinguished lecturer for ASHRAE, present on ASHRAE Standard 62.1 2019, and why it is important that we properly ventilate a space and some of the ventilation design considerations advocated by the standard, as well as uh, uh, Hoy's own personal experience on doing so. The last session we had was on humidification. Uh, why is it that humidity or properly hu proper humidity levels as expressed by ASHRAE will reduce the risk of, of infection in the space due to the aerosolization or the reduced aerosolization rate of pathogen expect, expelled into a space, as well as enhanced immune system uh, performance so we can hopefully evacuate any pathogens we may have ingested into the space. So please know that any and all of these presentations are available if you're new to the sessions and want to get caught up. Uh, if you go to ASHRAE's or, or to veritechsolutions.com uh, and uh, go to the educational tab. I'll let uh, Kelly clarify that. All these recorded sessions are available for you to review. And of course, Veritech is here to support you if you have any questions on those sessions. So let's drill into the, today's presentation. <clears throat> let's look at the CDC and ASHRAE and uh, COVID-19 transmission update. First of all, on May 7th, last Friday, the New York Times posted an article that stated SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted by exposure to infectious respiratory fluids. This is an update from the CDC compared to their previous October 2nd statement, which acknowledged it, but was a little vague. The language today is more aggressive. It states that the principal mode by which people are infected with SARS-CoV-2 uh, is through exposure to respiratory fluids carrying infectious virus. Exposure occurs in three principal ways, inhalation of very fine respiratory droplets and aerosol particles. And I'll let you read the rest of it from there. But this is a big step forward in the recognition that ASHRAE has been dialed in appropriately with the means of transmission, how we need to be aware of uh, infection beyond the six foot social distancing guidelines previously uh, 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 recommended. Now, don't get me wrong. 
uh, you maximize your risk of exposure by being within the six foot social distancing area because of the size of droplets that could be ingested. But um, uh, uh, now we have validation and confirmation by the CDC that we need to be concerned about aerosolized viruses as well. The CDC in their K through 12 schools COVID-19 mitigation cool toolkit does address in their checklist number four that ultraviolet germicidal radiation has been considered as a supplement to help kill SARS-CoV-2, especially when increasing room ventilation options are limited. So uh, the CDC acknowledges uh, UVGI technology as a means for pathogen mitigation. ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force updated its position on April 5th, 2021, stating with more aggressive language, airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is significant and should be controlled. And says changes to building operations, including the operation of heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems can reduce airborne exposures. So uh, we're seeing more and more pressure now uh, with the government, with our standard writing agencies of recognizing that airborne transmission is a true risk. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> here's the most latest news that I just got this morning and I had to update the uh, PowerPoint that you're hearing. Today, ASHRAE released an announcement. It's called the ASHRAE and IUVA Sign Memorandum Un of Understanding. Uh, <clears throat> IUVA stands for the International ultraviolet association. And the letter and announcement that I received states, ASHRAE and the International Ultraviolet Association have signed a new more memorandum of understanding formalizing, and that's important, formalizing the organization's relationship. Establishing and maintaining improved indoor environmental quality is the bedrock of ASHRAE's sustainability mission and the use of ultraviolet technology is a critical component towards addressing the challenges of minimizing the spread of infectious diseases. That is a bold statement. This is a bold collaborative, and uh, it's gonna be interesting to see what develops out of it. Uh, in the letter, in the newsletter that I received, it did mention these bulleted options uh, that they're gonna be pursuing together. Uh, tested measurements on specific pathogens across a specified light spectrum. Uh, UVC uh, ranges of 200 to 180 nanometers, 280 nanometers, and in various types of mediums, whether it be an aerosol, a large droplet, or surface dry and wet, uh, or wet and dry surfaces. It's going to uh, do tested measurements on the efficacy outcomes excuse me, for antimicrobial UVC devices and systems in well-defined testing environments, such as simulated hospital rooms. The letter goes on to list other rooms as well. And then it says, test and measurements on efficacy outcomes for antimicrobial UVC devices and systems installed in upper room HVAC applications. So um, very important development here. Uh, ASHRAE is going to be investing some money here to get us expanded data that we need to help create healthier environments. And it is in today's session that I hope to make you aware of uh, the promise of what this technology has to offer. So before we move further, let's validate why UVGI is being given every consideration. Well, ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force and their position document on infectious aerosols that can be accessed through the guide to the COVID-19 pages on ASHRAE's website. Uh, under the ventilation and air cleaning strategy section, it says the entire ultraviolet UV spectrum can kill or inactivate microorganisms. Ultraviolet germicidal radiation inactivates microorganisms by damaging the structure of nucleic acids and proteins and the effectiveness dependent upon the UV dose and the susceptibility of the microorganism of that dosage. So uh, uh, some language from the Epidemic Task Force. In the, in the link from filtration and disinfection, 
uh, in the ultraviolet energy UVC section, it goes on to state that ultraviolet energy inactivates viral, bacterial, and fungal organisms, so they are unable to replicate. Uh, it goes on to say the entire UV spectrum is capable of inactivating microorganisms, but UVC energy wavelengths of 100 to 280 microns provides the most germicidal effect. And then it says roughly 95% of the energy produced by these lamps is radiated at near optimal wavelength of 253.7 microns. So uh, pretty good instruction uh, on the application of UVC. Uh, in the task force uh, on the COVID-19 uh, page under the filtration and disinfection link, uh, ASHRAE states three applications of UVC light. There is induct air disinfection. There is upper air disinfection mounted within the occupied room and induct surface disinfection. And we're gonna be covering each of these uh, uh, throughout this session. But before we do, as you know, I'd like to go back to fundamentals and let's review that we have a common understanding of what the nature of light is. Trust me, it's more complex than this, but uh, we did want to try to get this done within an hour. Um, so what is light? Light is electromagnetic radiation. What is electromagnetic radiation? It is a form of energy. And remember, we covered in session three the definition of energy as the ability or capacity of doing work. Electromagnetic radiation is energy transfer or heat tra transfer in the form of waves. So how is light generated? Uh, light is generated when photons are emitted from atoms, when electrons in unstable higher orbitals drop to more stable lower orbitals. So <clears throat> in the conservation of energy, uh, energy has to be released for that to occur, and it's released in the form of a photon. A photon is the smallest quantity of energy that can be transported. And it behaves when it moves, uh, and it moves in a straight line. It behaves in a wave particle duality relationship. It's not that simple as I came to understand, but um, just use that for reference now. It behaves like a wave and a particle when transported. <clears throat> there are various, uh, the, the electromagnetic radiation electromagnetic spectrum is expansive. There are high energy levels that are comprised of shorter wavelengths measured in nanometers and define the characteristic of energy along the spectrum. There is higher, uh, the higher the frequency uh, 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 of a electromagnetic wave at higher energy levels. That is to say that the, uh, uh, the overall wavelength is compressed and you have a greater full cycle turn at high energy levels. At low energy levels, you have longer wavelengths and you have lower frequencies and the intensity of that energy is measured by the amplitude, which is defined as half the height of a wave from its peak to its trough. So what are some examples of high intensity electromagnetic rays or waves? <clears throat> excuse me, gamma rays are the most powerful form of uh, energy that travels on the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it is radiated, the wavelengths of gamma rays are very small. They're smaller than the size of an atom's nucleus. So they, gamma rays travel very easily through uh, surfaces and solids. Um, gamma ray facts, pretty interesting, a wavelength of high intensity gamma rays is roughly about 10 picometers or 10 to the minus 12 meters, extremely small. One of the main sources in our universe of gamma rays are supernova events. When gamma rays are released at such a rate that they can release more energy in 10 seconds than all of the energy emitted by our sun throughout its life. So that's pretty intensive, extremely intensive energy. Uh, we can create gamma rays uh, here on Earth, and the medical industry is actually using it to treat cancer because their effectiveness in killing living cells. There are low frequency radio waves uh, and extremely low frequency radio waves. 
Radio waves have extremely long wavelengths as they actually transmit less energy. A low energy wave has a wavelength of roughly 62.14 miles and extremely low frequency wavelengths have wavelengths of about 62,137 miles or over two and a half times greater the size of Earth. So um, what an expansive range of electromagnetic radi radiation. And I always, I have an interest in astronomy and it's amazing. It's amazing to think that the information that we're gaining of the universe really is communicated through this electromagnetic spectrum, through this electromagnetic radiation. And it's a fascinating study. Well, what is visible light? Visible light is electromagnetic radiation uh, that is at a level of between 400 to 700 nanometers. Your high energy violet light is at 400 nanometers, shorter wavelengths as we expressed earlier, shorter wavelengths, higher energy. 700 nanometers is the range of red light and the longer the wavelength, the less energy. Visible light radiation has wavelengths about the size of bacteria. So uh, that just gives you some idea of what sort of size we're dealing with. So let's get to the meat of today's topic. What is ultraviolet light? UV light is a form of electromagnetic radiation that is just outside of the visible spectrum. Um, and so it cannot be perceived by the human eye. And its range lies between 100 and 400 nanometer wavelengths. The federal, or the Food and Drug Administration has offered this comment on UVC radiation, uh, that it is a known disinfectant for air, water, and non-porous surfaces. UVC radiation has effectively been used for decades to reduce the spread of bacteria such as tuberculosis. UVC radiation may also be effective in inactivating the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, that's from the Food and Drug Administration. Well, just like there are ranges of energy along the electromagnetic spectrum, there are ranges of energy in the UVC light, in the UV, in the UV light range. There's UVA long wave light that's responsible for skin tanning and wrinkles between 315 and 400 nanometers. There's UVB medium wave light responsible for skin reddening, sunburn, and skin cancer. Uh, there's UVC light, and this is what we're gonna focus on today. And its range lies between 200 and 280 nanometers, and it is most effective for germicidal control. It's like a key going in a lock. That narrow band is really what is effective in deactivating or neutralizing germicidal agents. Then there's more powerful UV or vacuum UV light. Uh, at this higher level, you can create ozone uh, at the UV light uh, wavelength range of 100 to 200 nanometers. So uh, uh, those are the ranges of UV light uh, that are defined and we're gonna concern ourselves with UVC light. So what type of products are available to generate UVC light so that we can actually neutralize pathogens? Well, <clears throat> UVC lamp technology uh, is a technology that uses low pressure mercury lamps. And they are similar to fluorescent tubes. And they have electric, electronic discharge, electrical discharge through argon gas that strikes the mercury vapor, causing it to fluoresce. However, unlike conventional fluorescent tubes, there is no internal phosphor coat uh, uh, within the, the glass. And the glass is a special, highly engineered glass made of fused quartz. And when you have this combination of no phosphor and engineered glass, the light emitted as electricity passes through the argon gas and mercury vapor, you have a discrete production of UVC light at 253.7 nanometers. So um, that is literally the technology behind the light. Just think of it as a fluorescent bulb that is engineered to really focus in on the narrow bandwidth or wavelength of uh, 253.7 nanometers. So um, many of these devices uh, do require a ballast, but not all. 
And these, the lamp life is generally about 9,000 hours. So you figure about changing out a lamp about once a year if you're running 24 seven, which is uh, something to consider certainly for commercial and institutional applications. The lamps come in two config, well, four configurations. There are single ended lamps that we use to insert with inside a plenum wall or a duct wall that allows for ease and change out with one point of connection to its hub. Uh, then there are double-ended devices for larger coil banks, such as an air handler coil with pins similar to what you may have experienced with fluorescent lights and changing them out. And you can get lamps in either high output or low output or standard output uh, 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 configurations. However, our manufacturers recommend use the high output because there really is very little cost difference. And why would you want to do anything less than maximize the output of UVC light for creating healthier environments. But also be aware that we can get these devices with a fluorinated ethylene propylene encapsulation that pre it, should the lamps be broken, if there's being service done on the air handler, you won't have glass shattering and falling all over the air handler floor. It'll be contained with this, in this FEP casing. ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force <clears throat> in their filtration and disinfection tab states that it should be, uh, the application of UV, uh, UV light should be considered for induct air disinfection, upper air disinfection, induct surface disinfection. So there are many different ways we can use the technology. So what is ultraviolet germicidal irradiation? So let's take UVC light and see how it might work on deactivating pathogens. Again, going back to what I just mentioned, the UVC light generated by ultraviolet lamp technology provides a wavelength of light at 253.7 nanometers. It, at this wavelength, virtually all microbes can be deactivated, neutralized, and it does so by, because that light actually penetrates the, the encapsulation of a virus, the protein capsule, and can deconstruct the nucleic acids, RNA and DNA molecules within that capsulation and causing those molecular structures to deconstruct. <clears throat> so um, if you have deconstructed or de misshapen DNA and RNA molecules, that pathogen can no longer reproduce. And if it cannot reproduce, it cannot be a, it is not a danger to any human who might ingest it. Um, please know that every germicide has a different uh, uh, absorption factor of UVC light. And science has assigned what is called a K factor of absorption. So depending on the pathogen, you may try to mitigate by using UVC light, we would want to know what that pathogen is to make sure the appropriate dosage is supplied to maximize the effectiveness of the technology. Uh, the ASHRAE journal in May 2021 uh, actually came out and stated uh, in an article that the germicidal ultraviolet light is one technology for which there is strong documentation of effectiveness and safety. That documentation demonstrate the effectiveness of various types of germicides. Some germicides are more responsive to deconstruct, being deconstructed or broken apart by UVC lighting. Well, the good news is with our current pandemic challenge, we are confronted with coronavirus. It is a virus and viruses are very easily deconstructed or their nucleic acids, molecular structures decouple uh, by using UVC light. Your more complex living organisms such as fungal spores or bacterial spores uh, do require higher do dosage to maintain uh, 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 the same amount of effectiveness. And here is some testing done. It's listed in the ASHRAE handbook under the HVAC applications that at a dosage of 2000 microwatts per centimeter squared of surface area, that in a matter of seconds, uh, at uh, 2,000 microwatts, 99.9% .9 of coronavirus will be deactivated. 
Influenza is a little more challenging, so we'd want to upsize a lamp in order to create the 99.9% .9 effectiveness. Uh, again, we would like to know what type of pathogen any owner or client is trying to uh, 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 mitigate, and then we'll assign the appropriate dosage for UV lamp selection uh, that is uh, being sought after. If you're using the technology in upper air disinfection, that is to say within a built environment, a recommended design guideline is between 30 to 50 microwatts per centimeter squared of surface area. And at that level, you can see 99% deactivation effectiveness of aerosolized pathogens within a first pass. Uh, so that's pretty powerful. <clears throat> if you have a recirculating system or proper mixing in the space, um, certainly you'll effectively deal with that pathogen on the second and third pass within that space. So um, a lot of studies that stand behind this and support these findings. What are the considerations of UV light? Well, being part of the electromagnetic spectrum, a form of energy transfer, heat transfer that occurs in a straight line, you need to have a direct line of sight from the UV generator to the area that you are trying to treat uh, or disinfect. You can use the technology in induct airborne disinfection, otherwise known as on the fly. Uh, but you need to take into consideration, what is the air velocity? Our manufacturer expressed to me that if you have an air velocity of a thousand feet per minute or more, probably not a good application for the uh, technology because there's just not enough exposure time of any germicide to the UV light for it to be as effective as we would otherwise want. Air temperature and relative humidity play a factor in the amount of lamp output we use. Exposure time, duct dimensions, what is the duct reflectivity, and we'll touch on that shortly. All of these aspects in an in-duct air disinfection application need to be evaluated. An ASHRAE's Epidemic Task Force uh, Filtration and Disinfection section, uh, uh, ASHRAE makes the statement that banks of UV lamps installed inside air handlers or HVAC or associated ductwork is certainly uh, a, a recommendation. However, if you use UV light in an on-the-fly application, it requires more UV dosage than you would have if you were merely trying to keep surfaces in the direct line of sight of a UV generator free of microorganisms. Um, so the general design considerations are, it's best if you can maintain velocity of about 500 feet per minute or less, we can design the technology for higher velocities up to 1,000 feet per minute, but the faster the air, the higher the dosage, the higher the energy. So uh, all of this is a calculation that can be done and effectively applied once we know the design parameters. You can use UVC light in upper air disinfection. Uh, <clears throat> you want to keep in mind that you want to locate these devices at a minimum of seven feet above the floor, but you can actually neutralizes, pa neutralize aerosolized pathogen within the room literally within seconds, not minutes and not hours. And by applying a non-reflective baffle at the bottom of the device, you can focus that UV ray upward and outward so that that light does not enter into the occupied zone where it could present a potential health concern. Uh, in doing, using this application, you want to look at using natural air currents. ASHRAE's 2019 handbook states that you want to optimize mixing in the space, so you're always drawing aerosolized pathogen from the room into the upper levels of the room where they can be exposed to the uh, UVC beam and consequently deactivated. You can use the technology as well for energy savings and for better IAQ by using it to keep cooling coil surfaces clean and free of any biofilm or biomass that will generate over time on a condensing coil. Uh, <clears throat> for the same reasons as mentioned earlier, the UV light breaks apart the nucleic 
acids of these uh, 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 bioagents and prevents the buildup of, uh, uh, of any fungus or bacteria on the coil faces. Thereby you maintain the free area on your coils and maintaining a free area on your coils, you reduce the amount of horsepower on an air handler needed to pass the air through the coil and make the, keeping these units in line with the efficiency that they were originally designed to maintain. Plus, you don't have any free floating bacteria being uh, pulled off of the coil itself and injected into the supply air and deposited to the room. So uh, some real advantages for using UV technology for coil cleaning applications. Uh, some of the considerations that ASRAE uh, recommends for keeping in mind if you're doing uh, surface treatment is that um, you want to look at mounting these devices in and around cooling coils and drain pans where we are more likely to see greater amounts of bioagents being formed. Uh, and uh, so we want to treat that area locally so you prevent any wetted surface from building up this biofilm. Um, it goes on to say that some of the design considerations for a uh, induct surface disinfection application is you want to make sure that UVC light is energy is spread uniformly throughout the coil face. Uh, we can assist in evaluating that you are getting the right microwatts per centimeter squared of coverage on that coil once we know the coil length, the air velocity, the air temperature, all of those factors. Uh, also, you want to mount the devices between 12 and 36 inches from the coil space and just let them operate 24 seconds so they're always acting on those surfaces and preventing the growth of bioagents. So what are some UVC layout uh, 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 concerns uh, and uh, design considerations? <clears throat> well, it depends, of course, on the application. Using UV light generators for a duct air disinfection application or an on the fly application. Again, well, let's revisit this point because it's an important point. The owner needs to decide what type of pathogen he is trying to mitigate. If he is only targeting SARS-CoV-2 that <clears throat> is, uh, or coronavirus, that can be 99.9% .9 neutralized at 2,000 microwatts per centimeter squared, then we might not be, then we would not be as effective on flu. And of course, flu season really does play havoc with us every year. So we may want to consider about upsizing the actual lamp output to treat flu and consequently grandfather in effective treatment of any coronavirus in the space. So these are the considerations that need to be evaluated. You need to be looking at exposure time. What is the velocity of the air across the device? What is the length of a direct line of sight the generator has down the duct exposing any aerosolized pathogen to the UVC beam, allowing for maximum effectiveness and neutralization? What is the air temperature of the air crossing the device? Warmer air is more effective and requires less UVC output. Colder air is less effective and requires more UVC output for it to maintain its effectiveness. One recommendation you may want to consider to address aerosolized pathogen into the space that is captured in a return air duct and to reduce the risk of it being transmitted into the supply air stream and redistributed to a building is to put it in the return duct. You have lower velocity air in that configuration anyway. You have air at room temperature, so you don't need the amount of, uh, uh, of voltage or dosage or output of lamp from them to maintain their effectiveness and consequently reduce the first cost of their ap uh, uh, application. Uh, and then, of course, we want to look at lamp locations. And of course, this is going to be unique to every uh, design building or whatever. And uh, uh, you'd want to, we'd want to make an evaluation of where that lamp should go within that duct system. Some other duct air disinfection considerations to keep in mind is, do you want to use FEP coating? Uh, that, I believe that's a typo there. I'm sorry. It should be FEP. Uh, uh, or outer sleeve 
uh, to insulate the lamp and increase output in colder air conditions. Another factor to keep in mind is the duct reflectivity factor. Stainless steel, galvanized steel, and aluminum reflect UVC light at different intensities. Consequently, if you select a dosage, we'd want to ask what type of casing is surrounding the device so that we can add an extra 50%, 40% to the overall output due to the reflectivity factor of UVC, making it uh, uh, more effective than its assigned voltage output. So uh, that's an important consideration. For upper air disinfection, <clears throat> uh, you could very well want to consider it for areas that are subject to high occupancies. Uh, what about healthcare for patient rooms, PE rooms where we have immunocompromised patients? Uh, what about emergency waiting rooms where we have uh, people with infections sitting in the room uh, expelling viruses uh, uh, into that space? And as we evaluated in our the physics and pathogen presentation, we demonstrated that I think it was uh, at uh, uh, half a liter of air per tidal breathing at 12 tidal breaths or 16 tidal breaths per hour of a regular adult, you release in one minute eight liters of air. And if you're sick, that's a lot of contaminant. Well, if that contaminant can somehow be drawn up into the upper levels of the room by proper mixing of the space, it makes all the sense of the world to apply this technology to reduce the amount of concentrations within the space. We can look at it for doctor's offices, senior living centers, and areas that increase the potential for community spread. And there's now a presentation out on using it for schools. So uh, that's a pretty interesting development, uh, which we can cover at perhaps some other time. So some upper air room disinfection considerations, you wanna consider it where there's limited mechanical ventilation or no mechanical ventilation available. You wanna look at it for high occupant density areas and if there's a budget challenge, using UVC technology is a good first cost approach to deactivating pathogens in the build environment. <clears throat> when you're um, uh, um, looking at mounting upper room disinfection, again, we're going to revisit the point that you want to mount these generators seven feet uh, above the finished floor. Uh, and uh, in such a way that you have effective coverage of the upper elevation of the room, the manufacturer that we work with will assist us in that evaluation, help select the output of the in-room lamps that we would provide and where they would go if we have the geometry of that space to maximize coverage. Uh, but again, be aware that even in-room or upper air disinfection is very effective within seconds for our common illnesses, measles, mumps, TB, viruses, and flu, as well as coronaviruses. So what does ASHRAE's 2019 handbook have to say regarding upper air disinfection? It says upper air UVC is very effective in areas with no or minimal ventilation, two air changes per hour, up to six air changes per hour. So this is interesting, and I put this in here because when we look at 100% outside air systems or maximizing outside air ventilation to a space, this is a good factor to be aware of, that this technology can be effective for up to six air changes per hour. Uh, we need to make sure that the ventilation patterns promote good air mixing in the space, so you're always drawing room air up into the supply air jet and for allowing it to be subjected to the UVCB. Uh, and uh, the handbook also goes on to state that the effectiveness of upper air UVC is related to air mixing, relative humidity, and the inherent characteristics of the pathogenic organisms we are trying to uh, deactivate within the space. So again, all points that we mentioned earlier, but we need to drive them home when considering this technology. But again, uh, the handbook goes on to state that effectiveness can be improved greatly when you have a well-mixed air condition within the space. So <clears throat> that begs the question, when do we have cold and flu season? 
well, it's during our fall, winter, and spring months. Our HVAC systems are designed so that we can meet the challenge of peak loads. So when we are subjected to the times of year when it is driest, and we've already displayed or demonstrated that well humidified environments reduce the risk of infection, are also our low load seasons where air is supplied at 50%, 60% of flow and discharge velocities at diffusers on a VAV system are reduced, then you're not having the induction into the space at that part load condition during our most contagious time of year. So this is something to consider. And if you have a package rooftop uh, installation, which technically per code should have ventilation throughout the occupied hours, but if it cycles on and off, then you have times when the unit isn't even running allowing for any pathogen expelled in the space to stay local to the breathing zones of the occupants, uh, thereby creating a uh, health hazard of concentrations of pathogens. So some, one design consideration that I invite you to consider if you're looking at an in-room solution is how do we maintain high discharge velocity on a diffuser uh, when we're at part load condition. And there are technologies out there today that will adjust the free area of the diffuser to maintain room space set point temperature and still and, and be able to discharge the air at high velocity, even though it's at low flow, so you can maintain thorough mixing in the, in the room. And uh, this is my opinion that it should be considered uh, if you are do have those challenging environments with high occupancy densities that uh, was served by a VAV system and arguably a DX system, a package rooftop system, look at these diffusers. There are numerous manufacturers that will maintain the right discharge velocity to encourage room air induction into the supply air jet, allowing pathogens to be drawn up into the UVC ray or beam. So the maintenance and safety of, uh, of this type of equipment, what consideration should we keep in mind? <clears throat> well, first of all, we have to be aware that UVC bulb effectiveness is such that um, you could have 10 to 20% D rate on that bulb over a year. So the manufacturer that we work with, and I think it's an industry standard, uh, re requests that every owner change out the bulbs once a year to make sure that the technology is maintaining its effectiveness. Um, if you try to run the lamps longer than 9,000 hours, uh, you're gonna have lamp outages and whatever, and uh, you'll lose the effectiveness in creating, uh, in creating a healthier environment. Uh, another design consideration is to prevent glass from breaking and falling to the ground with some of these devices is to use the FEP coating that will contain any glass breakage and prevent it from spilling out onto an air handler floor. Uh, also, your facility staff need to be trained on the technology. You don't want to just subject yourself to the exposure of UVC light. Uh, it is not good for you. It's not, uh, it has various effects. So facilities teams need to be trained on safety factors when using this light <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the things to consider are wearing proper eye protection when inspecting UVC lamps, ensure that they are turned off during replacement and air handler service, look at control strategies, uh, typical control package uh, can, uh, with a cutoff switch located just outside of a plenum door to make sure the lights are disabled, or you could even provide a door interlock switch on the air handler that will disconnect power to the lamp in the event the door is open. Um, so uh, uh, you can also provide uh, viewing ports through access doors with a UVC inhibiting agent that will allow somebody to look in at the lights to make sure they're operational without having that UVC impact their field of view. <clears throat> so in conclusion, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation what is it? Well, it is a tried and proven technology for many, many decades, probably in the realm of 50 to 80 years. It is recommended as a good solution by the Center for Disease Control. It is endorsed by ASHRAE. 
as a good pathogen mitigation solution and ASHRAE outlines various good practices on how to apply the technology and guidelines on how to use it effectively. It is a reasonable first cost strategy for reducing the risk of infection in the build, build environment. They're very easy to operate. And though you do need to change bulbs out once a year, it's a pretty easy process, not labor intensive, but it needs to be addressed. Another thing to be aware of, again, and I touched on it in the beginning, is ASHRAE's growing expansion of doing research of UV technology with the IUVA, the International Ultraviolet Association, to evaluate how the products that are available today might be expanded so that we can look at new ways of applying the technology so that we maintain the effectiveness in perhaps ways that uh, or go beyond the current installations recommended by ASHRAE and the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force. And if you need, if you're considering UV light technology, please be aware there are manufacturers representatives. Uh, once we know the design conditions, once we know the actual geometry of the building, what is the owner's intent, et cetera, we can support in selecting the dice, uh, uh, in selecting the devices with the appropriate UVC outputs to disable and neutralize the targeted pathogens an owner is trying to uh, 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 get rid of within this space. So um, uh, please be aware of that. This is a real technology that isn't looked at too much beyond healthcare, but I think uh, with the challenges before us in the future and the pandemic uh, that um, the industry might be taking a closer look at it and if there are any questions that we, you might have regarding the technology, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, Dan, at this moment, we don't have any questions. Okay. So, um, so yeah, anybody, if you have a question, go ahead and add it. We've got and I would like to say that, um, um, and you'll probably say it yourself, uh, but we will be posting this presentation uh, 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 on the Veritech Solutions website. Yep, I'll uh, email it out as well. Yeah, we, there's a lot of information covered within an hour here. And, and, and I do make it my purpose to give you as much information as I can within that hour, but with the full awareness that once you, we leave today, you have a resource to go back and revisit this presentation on our website, as well as our previous sessions. So as we begin to expand in the webinar series, and we start looking at system solutions, you can always go back and look at these presentations. And say, oh, that's what Dan meant about why 100% outside air systems could be applied with UV light applications or higher filtration or humidification, etc. So um, uh, this is very much hopefully a developing integrated seminar platform and uh, please feel free to use it to as a, you, you, you might see fit. All right, and Justin, you guys have some questions? Yeah, can we do audio or we have to just type everything? You can do audio. <laughs> okay, I didn't know there'd be feedback. So right now we're probably primarily looking at this as a retrofit application, you know, installing UV lights in existing air handlers. Um, just because obviously nobody knew about this before COVID really. Going forward, however, I, I think almost all manufacturers are gonna have this as a factory option on a new air handler. You know, nobody's gonna design an air handler for a hospital next year that doesn't come with UV light. So instead of just hoping the lights are in the right place on, you know, A cabinet, a B cabinet, C cabinet, or whatever, is actually working on some kind of standard where whether I order an AN unit with UV light or a Daikin unit with UV light or whatever, I know that you know, the, the intensity and the location of those bulbs in the air handler is going to all provide similar protection? Uh, Justin, excellent question. And the answer is yes. In the newsletter submitted today by ASHRAE and their relationship with the IUVA, one of their goals is to create the standards that you're looking for. But right now they don't exist. We, we want to rely on our manufacturers' expanded uh, resources and experience and allow them to give us their input on where the installation should occur, the length of bulbs, depending on coils, depending
depending on air velocity, depending on pathogen. But ASHRAE's stated goal with this memorandum with the IUVA is to create the standards you might be looking for. Okay. So in the meantime, in a retrofit application, you know, let's say we have a hospital that has 20 different existing air handlers on it, all slightly different configurations, geometries, base velocities and whatnot. What's our, as a consulting engineer who's been tasked with designing a, you know, adding ultraviolet light to a, to a property like that, what's our best resource? Um, are you guys providing that type of design assistance? If I can provide you, you know, cut sheets for the existing air handler, are you, you know, is it really a custom design right down to the, the coil size and the box size or how specific are you yes. guys getting a retrofit? It is, it is, because we've got to assess the dosage, the lamp output, based on the application, the air temperature, the location. And this is something that we would work with our manufacturer and you to evaluate what is the appropriate lamp size per the installation location and the proper dosage based on the pathogen that's trying to be ameliorated or removed from the space. So we would work with you on that effort, absolutely. Yeah, and Justin, if you guys get uh, Joe Murphy involved, um, he I know he's done this already for other projects with UV resources. So um, he would be really great to help you with that. Okay, if we, if I just reach out to you, Kelly, can you put us in touch with the proper people? Because we have, we have active yeah. projects going on right now. Where we're yeah, absolutely. All the problem. Yep, I'll yeah. email him and copy you guys on it. Okay, on, on retrofit applications, um, it looks like it's a exterior box that would mount on basically the access panel to the coil. And then you have, you know, the various bulbs sticking in and then you were showing a driver kind of like on a, on a T8 lamp or whatever. Mm -hmm. Typically, where are you guys getting power for this? It, so I'm assuming it's line voltage 110 to the driver and then 24 volts to the bulbs or how, how exactly does the power side of this work on in a retrofit application? Well, you, you can either, if you have the terminals uh, aligned, you can just power it off the panel serving the air handler. Or you, if you don't have that, then you'd have to run separate line voltage to the device. So so typically air handlers on like a hospital or something are going to be sort 460 volt three phase. So if we tap into any of the three phases, we'd have 277 volt single phase. Is that are, are these devices orderable in that voltage? I believe they are, and I know we have a yep. David. I, did David Butts join yep. us, Kelly? Dave he, is on. He, yeah, uh, I'm here. Hi. Dave, Dave uh, thank you so much <laughs> for joining us, Dave. You have a more specific view of the products that you offer. Can you answer the question? Yeah, operating voltage is 120 to 277 single phase. And usually there's not much draw for energy on these lamps. So you could tap into one of the 480 legs, or there could be a GFI or another source of power that's easy to tap into. Okay. Is that, could they, is that, does that need to be predetermined on an air handler by air handler basis or are the devices, they can accept 120 or 277 and the contractor could figure out the power source in the field? Our submittal and quote has the electrical requirements based on 120 volts. So the amp draw is there. Um, what I always recommend is when you're there, measure the coil, fin height, fin length, and look at the available uh, capacity of the, of the electrical that's there now. Okay. I'm just saying, if, if they buy 50 of your devices and then go try to start putting them into buildings, to, is, it, is an individual device can accept 120 or 277, or that's two different models coming from the factory separate and they couldn't? Switch. Got it. No, it's an individual device. So the operating voltage okay. stands true across the board, 120 okay. to 277. Good question. Okay. I didn't catch it the first time. So on a retrofit application, um, and, and let's assume this is going in a roof on an air handler where the coil is, um, mm -hmm. are you typically putting this upstream or downstream of the coil? Because you kind of contradict yourself a little bit. You want the, you know, we're typically putting in the wetter environment to kill pathogens, which would be on the downstream side of the coil. Um, then you indicated that the effectiveness goes down with temperature. So and the temperature is going to be 20, 30 degrees warmer on the upside of the coil. So where are you putting it before or after the cooling coil? So typically <laughs> we're down. Go ahead. Um. Oh, uh, 
it, it, it depends on the application. Yeah. Um, if you if you if you really are after pathogen mitigation, then you would want to consider it on the upside of the coil, where you get maximum effectiveness and efficiency uh, uh, of the lamp. And plus, you have lower duct velocities at the inlet uh, potentially than any downstream duct. If you're looking to do surface cleaning, then we would mount it on the discharge side of the cooling coil so that we are deactivating any biofilm or biomass that might build up. But it will also add a factor of pathogen mitigation. But at, if, if, if that device is seeing 55 degree air, we will see a D rate of performance. Dave, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, well put. So on the return side, we have filters. And if they're not made of a pure glass material, um, the UV energy will break that down. If they are pure glass, um, back to your point, warmer air gives us better efficiency. So when we do typically downstream wet side of the coil, we upsize the lamps to uh, provide enough energy to first uh, keep the coil clean, reduce the pressure drop, and then provide a high level of air disinfection. In other words, a 90, 95% first pass kill. Yeah. So yeah, in a retrofit application, we definitely be concerned about UV damage. Um, and, and there probably is less stuff to damage on the downstream side than the upside. So yeah, it's, and they are also interested in keeping the coils clean. So it probably makes the most sense to put them downstream and just upsize them appropriately, knowing they'll be in a 55 degree environment. Does that sound reasonable? That's accurate. The only thing I would add to it, and I was on a pretty long job walk yesterday, um, wrap the foil, wrap the exposed wiring with yeah. Uh, foil tape. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about a lot of stuff in there. Wires, random, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people will switch out the drain pans with um, plastic pans instead of stainless steel. I mean, there, there could be a lot of stuff in an existing air handler that's going to get destroyed. Yeah, I mean, it's always good to take pictures. You can, um, there's no issue with belts. Uh, belts are replaced annually anyways. Okay. Um, but pictures and dimensions are our best friend. Okay. Um, I mean, what else I have? Do you have anything else? Yeah. Okay. Discussing you. Yeah. Okay. I think that's probably all we have right now. I'm sure there's something else I'm forgetting. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll send you an email so that that way you have Joe's contact information and you can have as many questions as you want. So, <laughs> one of your manufacturers actually indicated that um, net, the exact UV frequency that is optimize for keeping the coils clean, you know, keeping biological film and stuff. That is not necessarily the best frequency for you for viral radiation and vice versa. So they're, they're actually pushing a different product, whether you're really trying to keep biological film off the stuff or of your <coughs> viruses. Um, it doesn't sound like you guys have really made that distinction. If, if you have the UVC on the downside, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna kill whatever's there, virus and biofilm. Do you, does that sound, have you heard that at all from any Dave, of your competitors or? Dave, Dave, you, maybe you've had experience with that discussion or debate. I, so what I, was, I, I saw yeah. in my research that uh, a wavelength of 264 nanometers was optimal for viral mitigation, but Dave, what did, if you would please answer that with what you might know. Yeah, so two things resonate when you say that. Back to your point, Dan, we have a, a chart that shows uh, maximum performances at 265. Well, we're real close to that peak spectral line with our 253.7. I'm a heat transfer guy from the past. And when I see some of the pressure drop readings before UV, and then I see the pressure drop go down after UV, and that's part of the ASHRAE paper, research paper 1738, it's very well documented that the UVC cleans up the coil, returns it to an as-built condition, and gives us the heat transfer that we want. With COVID, we increase the dosage of the lamps uh, to provide a good first pass kill. So, so Dave, if, I, if, I, if, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying, <coughs> again, <coughs> identifying the target pathogen, <coughs> you can overcome that wavelength discrepancy of what is it uh, nine nine nanometers or ten nanometers by just upping the dosage. 
Well, we increase the dosage um, be, so because we don't always have the residence time. Our software uh, defaults to two feet off of the coil, and that gives us about a quarter second residence time um, for COVID. Um, but back to your point, Dan, there's a K factor involved with each pathogen that we're trying to identify. So I'm really glad that you did hit on that because there are other things um, that we want to eliminate. So we call it air disinfection. That's a broad stroke. But if you have other things, tuberculosis, um, then we, we need to look at it from a different angle, different math. So just to clarify, if you're going after a pathogen like mold versus a virus, are you, mm -hmm. are you recommending the same 253 UVC bulb and if you would just change the, the intensity or would you switch to a totally different frequency bulb? Let's say we're more worried about mold than a virus. No, the, lamp, the lamp would stay the same. Mold is just gonna take a little longer to inactivate, but molds are typically gonna build up on the drain pan and the coil. So. The lamp's in there um, working 24 hours a day, 365, 365 days a year. So the time would be a little bit longer for mold than it would be for say COVID. So it's really just the dose, you know, it is, we didn't understand it right. It's the doses were very, not, not necessarily the frequency of the bulb coming out of the product. Correct, <laughs> correct. Okay. I think we have quite a bit of work for you. You want to put, <laughs> you want to put this into uh, action? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we just had one more question in the chat, um, but he he already jumped off, so um, I don't quite understand. He said the VAV diffusers have had calibration issues and have posed maintenance challenges with adjustments in the past, like ten years ago. Has this been addressed, or is there still a consideration? <laughs> I, I, since I um, really am a product specialist on VAV diffusers and I've been out commissioning jobs, um, I'm not a, a, aware of that issue, quite frankly. My experience has been you set the thermostat adjustment, at least on the manufacturer that we've used and I've had experience with, and, and um, you're done. I, the problem with VAV diffusers is making sure that the owner knows what they have the power of room side adjustment that's available at their fingertips and what the solutions are. And, and, and um, uh, it can be easily addressed. And, uh, but no, I have not had any problem with calibration okay. of these devices. And how, um, I guess, I, how does that uh, relate to UV light? I, I guess that's the part that was, I didn't understand the question. Uh, well, UV light, if, if that diffuser, can continue to adjust its face area so you maintain a, dis velo a discharge velocity or high discharge velocity. When you're at part load at that higher discharge velocity, you will continue to draw room air, induce room air into the supply air jet, bringing any pathogen up into the ray of UV light in the upper level of the room. Whereas if you go to low flow on a conventional VAV system, your induction ratio of room air into the supply air jet will be compromised and the opportunity of exposure of any germicide to the beam will be mitigated. Okay. All right, I will uh, email him that answer since he already jumped off. Um, but that is all the questions that we have in the chat. Sorry, we went a little over, but those were some great questions. So definitely worth it. Um, Again, I will send out PDH certificates for anybody who said yes when they were registering, and I'll send out a link to our website once I have the recording and the PDF slides available to download. As Dan mentioned, those slides were so full of information, so we will definitely get that on the website so you can use it as a reference uh, looking back. Dan, any closing words? Uh, thank you very much for your time and your consideration, and we welcome any and all of your input. Uh, regarding this presentation and for future presentations. Uh, we, it, it helps us to understand what the market needs are, what the challenges are to our owners and design teams. Please communicate those to us so we can make sure we address your needs. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And I will be sending out um, registration for our June webinar, which will be needlepoint bipolar ionization. So look out for that.
And thank you, everybody. Thank you.